the benefactor. From 1988 to 1995, I grew up next door to the Rakes family in what was then a quiet suburb of the Hibiscus Coast, Red Beach. The youngest of one girl and three boys, Brayden was a year my junior. Known for his comic frivolity, he was a talented artist and sportsman who trained and worked as a car mechanic. He studied guitar and had a love of music, which led him to play the sixth string and sing in the late 90s and early noughties Auckland punk band Muffaloos, as well as take up trombone duties in the ska band Skivvy. In the last 10 years, I've only seen Braden a handful of times. The most treasurable friendships are those in which we're entirely comfortable being ourselves, despite long meeting gaps. I would apply that to us. Over these years, Braden heightened his faith in Jesus Christ. He told me about a mission he had been on in Liberia. I'd spent three months traveling alone on the African continent in 2006, but in much more tourist-friendly areas of the southern and eastern parts. Liberia was in a torrid hangover of a civil war, and I asked Braden if I could write about his experience. He agreed. I'd need to do some research to familiarize myself with this nation. Following Braden's suggestion, I watched the 2009 Vice documentary, The Cannibal Warlords of Liberia. I also read Journey Without Maps, a travel document about Liberia written by Graham Greene and published in 1936. I wanted to get some insight from a Liberian before undertaking this essay, so I was pleased when I found This Child Will Be Great by Alan Johnson Sirleaf, Africa's First Female President published in 2010. Rich in vegetation and well watered, Liberia's landmass covers 70,000 square miles and holds a population a little over 5 million. It is presumed that Liberia was first settled by migrants from the north and east of Africa between the 12th and 16th centuries. According to Liberian historian Abayomi Kanga, the first inhabitants were the Jina peoples, who were succeeded by the Gola, the Kisi, the Mantaningo, the Vai, the Gbandi, the Capelli, the Mendi, the Gio, and the Mano peoples. Later came the Basa, Dai, Grebo, Kru, Kua, and the Gibi peoples. Portuguese settlers arrived in the 15th century and exchanged goods for local Malagueta pepper. The Dutch and English made brief landings and traded in the 17th century. During this time, slaves were transported over the Atlantic to the United States. I've looked at various websites and researched historical books and academic essays to obtain further information about Liberia. Numbers are inconsistent. It is impossible to provide entirely accurate details with such varied data, so using what is available... I have constructed a timeline highlighting important events in Liberia's history as well as I can. 1820. Liberia is founded by free people of color from the United States. Their transportation funded by the American Colonization Society. Of approximately 4,000 immigrants between 1820 and 1843, fewer than 2,000 survived. 1846. American-born Liberian Governor Joseph Jenkins Roberts requests independence while maintaining close ties with the ACS. 1847. Liberia is granted independence. The country prevents takeover from European colonial forces due to funding and support from the ACS. 1926. The Firestone Rubber Plantation and Company is established, leasing over 1 million acres of land for 6 cents per acre for a period of 99 years. 1961. The Liberian Agricultural Company develops a 7,000 hectare rubber plantation. 1980. The minority Americo-Liberian regime, which has run the country since its inception, is overthrown by indigenous Liberians. 1989. The first civil war lasts until 1997. A quarter of a million Liberians are killed. 1999. The second civil war lasts until 2003. 
casualties are estimated to equal those of the first civil war. With a bit of background, I was now confident enough to speak with my subject. Many thanks for allowing me to interview you, Brayden. My pleasure. In 2013, what brought you to Liberia? My trip to Liberia was part of the outreach phase for my DTS with a global Christian missionary organization called Youth with a Mission. They have bases around the world. The base I was involved with and where I completed my DTS was in Hönhut, Germany. A DTS is a three-month lecture phase learning about God and missions, followed by two and a half months of outreach. The school is divided into groups of 20 or so people, including two or three leaders. Following graduation, you're given an option to decide on the locations the schools offer. I chose Liberia mainly due to our leaders simply saying, we have no real plan but to live amongst and love the poorest of the poor as Jesus would. How would you describe your introduction to the land and peoples of Liberia? We flew from Germany via Belgium directly to Monrovia and arrived around midnight. I remember the warm air hitting me as I walked from the aeroplane onto the tarmac. The immediate smell of burning charcoal and smoke was something that always stayed with me. We met our hosts and our team all crammed into a small van that was well over capacity, but I didn't think anything of it. I was excited and thankful to be there. Our host, Comfort, would cook us lunch and dinner. Our diet consisted of chicken, beans, cassava, plantains and sausage, always accompanied by rice. For breakfast, we'd have bread with various spreads and occasionally eggs and coffee. We'd only ever cook on pans over charcoal. Regarding water, we couldn't drink directly from the nearby well as we'd get sick. Local kids drank from it. We'd collect water from the well and boil it or buy it in plastic bags, which tasted putrid. It was hard in the heat to go without. Often we'd drink coke or sodas from local stores as they were cheap and easy options to keep hydrated. We stayed in a four-bedroom house in a place called Chocolate City. The men stayed in one room and the woman in two other rooms, all in bunk beds. I had some sickness while I was there, mainly stomach bugs that would pass. Other team members contracted malaria and got infections in their feet. We were all on malaria medication, though some of us stopped taking it as it gave us stomach aches and loss of appetite. We had all our recommended vaccines before departing Germany. The locals were generally healthy. I can't recall too many illnesses apart from some children who were clearly malnourished. I grew close to a young boy with Kwashniokor, a potbelly caused by a lack of good food where too much fluid in the body tissue leads to an inflated stomach. We were there purely with YWAM, though we did become friends with local churches and worked alongside them. At a basic level, YWAM's outreach is to know God and make him known. This can be interpreted quite loosely. For some that meant public evangelism and Bible teaching or church preaching. For others, it meant simply loving the neighborhood kids playing with them and teaching them games, etc. after school. Our leaders decided duty allocation and provided the framework. But as we stayed in one community most of the time, it became obvious what the community's needs were and team members could develop and foster their own connections and friendships. I watched The Cannibal Warlords of Liberia a documentary with a particular focus on a born-again Christian once known as General Butt Naked. He is said to have killed 20,000 people, including many children, whom he sacrificed and ate. Can you describe your lunch with General Butt Naked? Pastor Joseph Blayi, as General Butt Naked is now known, came over to introduce himself and talk about his story and ministry. Following the lunch, we spent a couple of days checking out his ministry, which offers young men from the slums the opportunity to join his construction team. He was a friendly and welcoming guy, happy to share how God had turned his life around. Can you list and describe your most intense interactions with locals? 
One night we heard a young boy next door screaming as we were cleaning after dinner. A team member had become friends with the family and went to investigate. The boy had been disobedient, and as punishment, his mother had rubbed pepper into his eyes. The girl on our team was distraught, and an argument ensued. Our local hosts reacted as though this was normal, and advised us not to get involved. I became friends with a group of older teenagers and young university students in the neighborhood. The first time I met them, one of the group came up to me afterwards and nonchalantly said, I killed many people in the war and I want to repent. I sat with him and we talked and prayed together. We spoke a few times after that, not so much about the war, but his hopes for the future, etc. On Christmas Day, our team decided to head to a local swimming beach. This beach is usually a guarded facility where UN workers and flight attendants live and associate. Due to it being a public holiday, the beach was free to the community. We had been there previously and spent a great day swimming and lying in the sun. Days off were uncommon. It was late in the afternoon and the beach was busy. Most people were by the water and only a few were swimming. I remember sitting halfway up the beach talking with a friend when I saw a boy in the water waving out at me. He was 20 to 30 meters away. He had two friends nearby who were also shouting for help. I ran and dived in the water. As soon as I came up from the break, the boy had disappeared. I called to his friends. Where is he? Where did he go under? They didn't know. I dived beneath the surface, but the visibility was poor. I couldn't see much at all. By this time, two of my co-workers were in the water, assisting me with the search. Despite the mass of tourists on the sand, no one else helped. After about 30 to 40 minutes of swimming, we were too tired to continue the search. We came in and started walking up and down the beach looking for any signs. Some of our team were asking me if it really happened, doubting my plea. Half an hour or so later, a couple of tourists were shouting to us from down the beach that there was a body floating. I raced over and saw the boy lying in the water. I pulled him ashore and some of my team helped me bring him up onto the sand. Two team members who knew CPR performed mouth to mouth. His throat was blocked with rice, vegetables and meat. He could not be revived. The crowd had gathered, some taking photos with their mobile phones. Medical response units are rare in Liberia. We stayed with the body until the boy's family came. After that, we simply had to catch our ride back to our house. The next few days were difficult for me. Three weeks later, a friend and I were on the back of a motorcycle taxi returning from West Point Slum. We had been shopping and praying for people all around the city. As our driver turned, an overtaking car blindsided us. My friend and I slammed into the windscreen and ricocheted into the air. We were about to come down under the front wheel and somehow ended up far apart. I rolled forward onto the side of the road, my friend further away. The driver limped off, leaving his bike. I think he feared being arrested and therefore left the scene. I got up and reached for my head in search of a wound as my upper left arm and chest were covered in blood. Witnesses came over. The blood's from your shoulder, not your head. I had glass embedded in my shoulder and left arm from the smashed windscreen. A policeman nearby had seen the accident and asked a local taxi driver to take us to our base. We had no way of contacting our team and went on to a local hospital run by an NGO. The policeman followed us and expressed what he saw to locals. These crazy white people flew through the air and landed on their feet. They were so strong, like martial arts, like Lionel Messi. I had a swollen ankle and scratched up arm and shoulder. My friend had a bruised abdomen and a few cuts. We were so thankful to be alive and remained in a quiet daze for a week or so. I felt so close to God. My friend and I began to rise early to pray and read our Bibles. It was oddly one of the best parts of the trip, as I realized how precious life is and that it could have been so much worse. 
You told me you had a special admiration and love for librarians and their attitude towards life. Can you sum this feeling up? What blew me away the most was their hospitality and generosity to strangers. Often walking off the beaten track down a sandy path, a voice would call out, White man! obviously to get my attention. Not in a bad way, but this became a normal occurrence wherever we went. Librarians would invite you into their home to learn your story and share a meal while revealing the history of their land. The people of Liberia were very welcoming at times, almost overwhelmingly so. A good kind of culture shock. The longer time goes by, the more I realize how special the experience was. I miss my team, I miss the smell of burning charcoal, the sight of chatting families and friends constantly barbecuing outside, the smoky West African sunset, the smiles and greetings, and the warm nights and bright stars following the disappearance of frantic bugs late in the night. I miss the quiet. Are you aware of any major positive or negative changes in the country since you were there in 2013? Ebola hit in 2014 after I left. I could still contact locals and help out directly via money transfers as prices for goods were inflated and trading in the country was restricted. The stories about Ebola ripping through West Point were horrific. I contribute financially to this day. I support people I met there with school fees, Christmas gifts, ministry help, etc. I believe it's important to continue the relationship with those people we were involved with. Otherwise, I'd see the trip ultimately being a wonderful experience, but nothing more, and not really fruitful.